Steve here. Today we're going to talk about Power BI and Fabric Direct Lake, about how we can do a refresh or a reframe in Direct Lake. In order to understand this, we'll go through a few concepts such as columnar store, parquet, and delta. And then we want to understand how the semantic model in a Direct Lake in Fabric and Power BI really works underneath the surface so we can see some different options such as keeping our data completely up to date or if we need a little delay for example we have an etl process that requires certain things to be done before we want to see updated data now before we jump straight into fabric we're going to head over to slides and get some of the uh, basic concepts First thing that we want to look at is something called column store. Now, traditionally things like CSVs store our data in a row store. Now a row store would store data something like this. Imagine we have this table with name, sales, and cost. The row store would then put this in rows. And so we don't store things in tables in, in underlying uh, file formats, but the data is stored in this row. So it makes a lot of sense because we have row one, row two, row three, and row four. And this is all stored next to each other. However, if we're a computer and we want to say, let's select the column name, well, what has to happen is that we have to do a big scan. And the name values, even though they're all in the same columns, are actually very far spread out. So row store is good when you're inserting a lot of rows and you've got very high volume of inserts, something like that. But when you're trying to do analytics, often we do analytics by column. So typically this is a bit slower when we look at things column by column, just because the data is very spread out. So as you may have guessed, when we have a column store, instead of doing row by row, we simply do column by column. So we store the data like this, and the first column, the second column, and the third column. Now, when we do scans and we want to access the data, for example, this, the data is very close to each other. And this makes it much more efficient for things like Power BI and analytical tools to scan the data. There's a whole bunch more optimization we can actually do as well when we do columnar stores we can actually make it very efficient and store the data and compress it really, really well. So the next thing we want to talk about is Parquet. Now, Parquet essentially is just a clone store. However, there's one little bit that we do and we sort of break things out into these row groups. So obviously this is a very small table but essentially what it does is it's gonna split your data up into these different row groups. And then within each row group, it's going to do a column store. Now, uh, when we have big data, this is actually a very efficient way of storing data. We kind of get a bit of a mix of the best of the both worlds here. You can see this is the first column, the second column, and the third column. And each of these then is stored as files. So when you have big data and you save it as Parquet, you would typically have lots and lots of files and you have many files, which are those different row groups. And then internally it's stored as a columnar store. Then finally, let's talk about Delta. Delta is essentially Parquet. However, what we're doing is we're just adding something called this transaction log. Now this transaction log is really just a record of things that we do. One thing about Parquet is that we can't edit Parquet files. And so if you want to change values in a table, uh, it's very difficult with, with Parquet files and it doesn't make it very easy. They're not great at these big analytical uh, tools when you're doing lots of edits. So that's what Delta does. It takes this Parquet format, which is a really nice compressed format, and it adds this transaction log. This allows you to do lots of things. And let's see, for example, we have this table. 
let's say we saved it as delta. So the first thing, you know, delta, it stores the data as parquet. So maybe we have file A and file B like this, and it splits up our data into these two parquet files. Now in this transaction log, what will happen is we'd say, we just write down exactly what happened and when. So the first thing you did is we saved it and we don't write this, right? It's done by the system, but it says it's loaded these two files, A and B, and it'll give you the date that this happened and the time. Then let's say we want to edit the, the Laura line. So that's the bottom one, which is in file B. Now with part A, we can't edit these files directly. So actually what happens is you need to delete file B and re-upload it with the correct values. And so when you edit something, it will go through, remove all the ones with the wrong and just re-upload with the new values. So actually what happens is there, we say we're gonna delete file B and we're gonna load file C. So file C is the new one. So we change Laura 19 to S17. And now what happened is we've said, task two on our transaction log. And we've said, load in the file C, delete file B. We've given the date. Now let's say we've realized we've done this wrong again, Alice was wrong, we want to change the value once more. So we're gonna delete file C and load in file D, right? Which has Sarah, which is the actual true value. And so we're left with file A and D. Now the magic of Delta and the Delta Lake is that file B and file C are not actually deleted. They stay within the lake. And if you read this transaction log from top to bottom, you could say, I load file A and B, then I load file C and delete file B, then I load file D and delete file C. If I went through and I followed all of these actions, I would be left with just file A and D, and this is my complete and up-to-date data set. However, one of the great things though with Delta is that what if I want to go back in time? And they call it time travel. So I want to say, let's say pick, you know, 01, 07, 2023. What I can do is I can just read up on the tasks until I hit that date and anything after that date, I won't complete. So if I just read up, I say load file A and B, that's within the date range I'm looking at. And then I say load file C, delete file B, that's also within the date range. So just by stopping at a certain date, I can go back in time. And because those files weren't deleted, are deleted, they're still there. If I just follow these tasks, I will be left with file A and C. And then I can actually see the data in this state that it was, for example, on the 7th of January, or in this case, any date between two and three. So let's now talk about the rect. So what is in a semantic model? Let's look through a semantic model first and understand how this rolls into the Delta Lake format. Within a semantic model, you can have two items. And we're gonna call this the data and the metadata. So the data in a semantic model, this is um, copied data from the source, right? To be using the old import mode, uh, which many people still do. What happens is we actually copy data into the model. We can't actually edit the data directly, right? We can give it Power Query code, which can tell the, 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 the system to update it and change when we actually run the refresh, but the data is not in a format. We don't get access to the database underneath within the semantic model. And actually this is stored in our columnar store format by the Vertipack engine. So this is the engine that runs it, and this is in a column store format. And the other end is the metadata. This is basically text-based code files. Um, and you know, in a model, we have the new Timdall format, which is just the format of the code. And this is everything that we write. So this is the bit that we edit. You know, the Power Query, the DAX roles, all of this stuff, it's saved in a text file called the metadata. And again, this is what it tells where the Power BI to get the data and how to aggregate it. So in an import mode model, we have data in the source. And let's say, imagine we're using Fabric. What might happen is we'll copy our data into Fabric, into a, into a de Delta Lake, you know, warehouse or a lake house. And we have a semantic model on top. 
And what might happen then is in import mode, right, we're going to copy the data once more into the semantic model. And then we have that metadata layer on top, which is all our DAX. Then in direct query mode, which is the other mode, we have the source. However, we're not using import mode. We're not copying the data. We actually just have this metadata in our semantic model. So we don't import them, uh, the data. And in this case, we're reading directly from the source. So there's no copying of the data here. Now let's look at this direct lake mode. Direct lake mode, so we have our data in the source. And now we have our warehouse or our lake house. We also have our semantic model. Now the difference is, what's happened here is, is Microsoft know that the delta lake that we use in Fabric is a columnar store you know, parquet. And the, the way that we store data in a semantic model is also a columnar store in a sort of similar format. So direct lake, we've made these two work together. And now what happens is we copy the data into our lake house or warehouse, and this database is shared. So we don't copy the data in Power BI. They both read off this same file format. And similarly, we just have our metadata layer here in the semantic model. However, the data itself isn't copied again from Fabric to the semantic model. It stays in Fabric, and both the warehouse and the lake house and the semantic model read the same data. And so if we look through this example, we might have bronze data, and this is a medallion architecture. And often in the bronze data, we'll just store it, uh, our data in files, or we store it in something like Parquet. So this might be our raw data stored in files. Then we might go through this silver layer. We say let's store things in a delta format. And essentially what this is doing is we're keeping the parquet, but we're just adding a delta log, which is the transaction log. And so this is just adding a bit of metadata when we store it in files. We might also do it with cleaning, but in terms of the storage, it's the same parquet with some extra metadata. And then in the gold, we might just do some additional logic. It's the same format usually in tables as it is in silver. Then if we're using our direct lake semantic model, where again, what we're doing here is adding more metadata. So we have this data in delta format, which is the, the parquet in the delta log. And now we're adding another metadata file, which is the Timdall or the semantic model file, which gives us that business logic. So as things go from left to right, we might clean the data up, but essentially we're adding bits of metadata along the way, keeping it in essentially parquet the whole way underneath the storage, but it's then go to delta and then semantic model, which just adds these extra metadata to give us more information. So now, what is a refresh in direct lake mode? In direct lake, we have this option to always keep up to date, but we can also turn it off and say, we want to refresh the data. If we're not copying data anywhere, how can we refresh it? This is useful because maybe there's multiple systems running. Maybe we need to check some data, part of the ETL process. We don't want things updating until we're sure everything's finished running. What this does though, is this takes advantage, Power BI takes advantage of the transaction log in the Delta format. So for example, we might have task one and two when we've got you know, file A and B was task one, we deleted file B and loaded file C. Here we might do a refresh and it says the current state is task two. So when we refresh in the direct lake, it doesn't re-import the data. All it does is it just looks in this transaction log and just sees where we are in the Delta process. Then let's say there's another task added in the same way that we did before. We deleted file C and added file D. However, this Power BI in the semantic model, we say where current task is task two. So just like the time travel, it's going to stay at task two and not read any more of the transaction log and not load any more of that data until we do the next refresh. So it's a really clever way of without having to copy the data. And obviously this is very fast because it's just checking the current state. We can go and change in the, in, in the source, in the, in the um, fabric, and it won't update in the Power BI until we're ready for it. With that, 
let's head over for an example. Here is my Fabric workspace. I have in here a direct lake demo, and I'll show you uh, my warehouse. It's very, very simple. I've got a simple one table with account values here, and it just has values with one column, and I'm inserting a value of one each time. Out of that, I have two direct lake models. And let me switch over to the direct lake models here, and I've put them side by side. On the left one here, I have the manual update. So I'm in the settings for the manual updates and then model. You'll see here down by refresh, I've taken off this keep your direct lake up to date. So it's not going to automatically read to the end of the transaction log. It's going to read whenever I click refresh. I could schedule or put this in part of my ETL process. For my auto update one, I can come down here and you can see keeping my day direct lake data up to date. So this is always going to be up to date. Um, and there's no refresh needed. I put a report here, and you can see I'm just doing a sum of the value, let me just be bigger, um, of the values in this one, uh, one column table here. So right now I'm at six for the manual update and the auto update. If I come back, and I'm going to run a SQL statement here, and I'm just going to add a value of one. So each time I click this, I'm going to click it once, and you'll see it will execute. I'm just adding a, a value of one as another row. There it's run. Let me do it one more time. So I've added two values in now. Okay, so this is now two. If I head back to my reports, I just need to, on both, click here. Let's refresh this one. Just refreshing the visuals, right? Refreshing the visual reports, not the model or anything. And I'll refresh here. You can see now that my manual update is still at six, even after refreshing. However, my auto update is at eight. This is because this is automatically kept up to date with the lake house. If I go back here and I go to my, my workspace, I can go now and click this refresh of my Power BI manual update. It's very, very quick. And now I can head back and you can see automatically, right, this has gone up to eight now because I've refreshed that. I've said this is the current task. Let me run again uh, this. Let me run it twice just to see the difference. And then I can come back again because this was refreshed on eight. If I refresh now, it's not going to update. However, if I refresh this one. So you can see this is a great way to keep your data up to date when needed but also to have a delay in order to allow certain things to run. For example, ETL processes, you want to make sure things have finished. If you have a complex process which has multiple steps, you might want to stop your Power BI keeping up to date. For example, when you're only your fact tables have refreshed and maybe not your dimension tables. Thank you so much for watching. Leave us a comment if you have any thoughts or want to go anything else. Please do like and subscribe to our channel. And it really helps us grow and keep everything on here free. And um, check out these other awesome videos. And until next time, thank you very much.